Good afternoon, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Rana Adib. I'm the executive director of Rent in One, the renewable energy pulse network for the 21st century. And I'm very, very excited to welcome you to the first uh, rendezvous Southeast Asia. Um, the first one of a three uh, event that will take place from July to September. And uh, before diving into topics, I'll hand over to Rebecca and uh, Katarina, who are going to accompany us uh, through this event and facilitate all interaction. Rebecca, good morning. Great to good, see you. Good morning, Rana. It's great to be here. I'm very excited and it looks like we've got a great representation from across Southeast Asia joining us today. Um, we're now uh, going to get um, underway with the uh, full agenda for today. We've got um, a couple of hours, uh, best part of a couple of hours that we're going to be spending together in this first of a pilot uh, rendezvous series for Southeast Asia from fossil fuels to renewables now strategizing energy transition and we're going to have some uh, great lightning talks by two speakers we will also be hearing from a couple of the partners with of REN21 and we will be having some very interactive Q&A's so what I'd like to do now is invite uh, Rana Adi back up to the stage um, executive director of REN21 um, to just set the scene for us um, for today's event welcome back Rana Thank you very much, Rebecca. And um, another warm welcome from my side uh, to all participating uh, as panelists in this uh, network community. We're very, very excited uh, to kick off this uh, pilot. It's the first exercise of Rent in One to have um, a regional rendezvous series. Um, since it's the first one, um, and many of you might know us or not know us, um, I'll take a bit of time to explain a bit of the background, uh, what leads us here. So I'm going to share a couple of slides. So um, maybe very quickly about Rent in One. So um, I'm leading the Rent in One Secretariat, which is based in um, Paris. But Rent in One is the only global renewable energy community of players from governments, intergovernmental organizations, NGOs, industry associations, and science and academia. And um, this is quite important and very indicative of what we are doing, because the reality is um, that when we are looking into the shift to renewable energy, governmental, we're speaking about a profound structural shift, and governments can play a key role in driving this, in creating the policy and regulatory frameworks. The reality is, however, also that um, implementing uh, renewable energy, creating the acceptance, um, developing the projects, uh, really anchoring it in any societal activity, does not only depend on governments, obviously. And in many countries, we also see that many of the other players can even contribute to raising government's ambitions. So it's really um, Rent in One's anchors very much in bringing these players together and have spaces uh, like, um, like this Asia to connect and see how we can collaborate to accelerate change. Now, I don't know, I can't, yes, here. What are we doing from Rent in One side? Uh, the objective is really to make the shift to renewables happen now. With this global community, we produce, um, there is clearly a decentralized intelligence. Think about us like an octopus, a network of networks uh, where we are connecting global to local um, players uh, or stories, um, renewable energy, success stories, etc. cetera. Um, we build upon um, this community to produce decentralized crowdsourced intelligence. And um, many of you might know the Renewables Global Status Report, the Renewables in Cities Global Status Report. And um, this information is being used to inform makers. So the pillars are clearly the knowledge, the community, and then the other pillar is dialogue and debates and communication. And this really brings us into this space. How did the Renewable Energy um, Rendezvous Series start? In November last year, we kicked, uh, we had a virtual Rent in One Academy, and the idea was really from evolution to revolution. It is clear that we need to accelerate the change. And I'll come to this later. This um, 
but uh, the idea was accelerating change, driving change, means obviously um, continuous action. So the idea was in the virtual space, especially in times of lockdown too, to see how we can bring this community together in a very dynamic space where we can connect and where we can identify how to build on each other and uh, drive strategic action. Um, at the same time, we have also kicked off the Renewable Energy Task Force, which is very much looking into this part about uh, strategic intelligence to influence in a much more strategic way with the objective to amplify the renewable voices and unify them to some extent. And unification uh, and amplification obviously happens at the global level, but happens at the local level. It happens on the energy supply side. So in the power sector, for instance, it also happens uh, in the energy consuming sectors. So what we also see is about broadening, basically, um, broadening the energy revolution. And uh, I'm coming to the last two slides, Rebecca. What needs to happen today is very clearly we need to mainstream renewable energy and we need to do this urgently and this means putting renewables into the political focus but also create market acceptance and broad market acceptance um, from renewable consumers or energy consumers who are actually very often not sitting around the energy um, debate table so to say, finance, insurances, etc but also societal acceptance and citizens' acceptance. And uh, to lead us to this topic, uh, which we have today, from fossil fuel to renewables now, strategizing um, energy transition in Southeast Asia. So you see basically this figure here. We're looking at the total final energy demand globally. This is uh, one of the <laughs> figures of the Renewables Global Status Report. There is great renewable stories. Um, uptake, investment has increased, and you see that the share of renewable energy and total fine energy demand has moved up. The reality is in 10 years' time, we only managed to move the fossil fuel share from 80.3% to 80.2%. What is clear today, it's not enough to support energy saving, energy efficiency and renewables we clearly need to collaborate to phase out fossil fuel and move from fossil fuel to renewable energy. And as such, I'm very much looking forward, obviously, to the discussions uh, which we'll have here in the region. Um, I would really like to, to underline, it's a pilot, it's a kickoff, we're learning. So please use this as your space. Uh, the objective is very clearly to link the global discussions to what is happening in the region and uh, to bring basically the regional voices again to the global debates too. So um, please tell us how we can serve um, the transition in Southeast Asia. Thank you very much and looking forward to interesting discussions. Thank you, Rana, for setting the scene for today's session. So at this point, what I'd like to do is invite Daniel Del Barro Alvarez, Southeast Asian Energy from the University of Tokyo to turn on his camera and microphone and join us on the stage. Hello, thank you, Rebecca. Welcome, Daniel. So now, Daniel, is you're going to give us a, a very insightful lightning talk, aren't you? Um, so off you go. <laughs> okay, let me share the window now. Just a moment. I think now. Okay, so nice to meet you, all, all the participants, and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion later. I'm going to start with a very brief introduction. I don't want to enter into much details. I think the discussion is going to be more interesting, and Hong Pen and Philip are going to touch upon many important issues. So this is just some kind of questions that I have been gotten through my experience researching in energy in Southeast Asia, especially in the Mekong region. And I think uh, Rana has touched upon many important issues. Uh, I think one of them is that here we are, we are talking that there is an energy transition undergoing and we have very good news, but it, we are really far from, from the goal. So we should keep uh, we should even increase our efforts or increase the efforts to move toward that. And I think one, one, some of the positive news come like in these decarbonization plans that we can keep seeing more and more and that they are gaining this uh, societal and economic and political attraction and support. 
it's also positive that when we talk about renewables, more and more we are not talking about only energy, but we are talking about uh, development in the broader sense or sustainability in the broader sense. It's not only about the power sector or the energy sector, but we are talking about transportation, we are talking about how we produce our goods, how we consume our, and how we relate or how we, how we build our cities and so on. And also there are positive news that when we talk about this kind of big news, it's not any more a surprise. Like we, we have the auctions in, or solar auctions in Myanmar that we, they were quite successful, even though the situation was uh, not the best ones. Uh, we have the story now also with solar in, in Vietnam and we keep uh, getting more and more news. But still there are many challenges ahead. And the, for this one, rather than focusing on the challenge per se, I'm just trying to kind of couple of, of four points that I think could be important and interesting that we can discuss more. And I, this is by no means is everything. It's just some of the ideas on how we are moving to this next phase of the socio-technical energy transition. Uh, as renewables keep uh, decreasing the cost, now we have to think uh, what what's next. And one of the points I mentioned here is that it's not only about solar. Uh, from our research, we when we discuss with citizens in, in the region, there is a pretty well knowledge about solar and people is very positive. But when we talk about other technologies, when we talk it's like offshore wind, that it's gonna be quite important for sure in the region, there are less knowledge. and having less knowledge about that or having less awareness about that, it can be a hinder to, to promote their acceptability and to promote them in the future. That we should, uh, then that is something that we should pay attention because the situation is not the same, the economics or the uh, technology behind is not the same. And we also have to talk not only about just build some solar plants or small projects, we are talking about uh, changing the, the entire energy system. We are talking not only, not even this uh, 25, 28% integration. We are, we should be thinking that what is going to be a 100% renewable energy system or going to be a 70% integration. What are the technical, economic, and societal challenges? Then there are solutions like interconnection. Well, how batteries are going to evolve? How, what is, is there any role for hydrogen in the region? What is going to be with the storage? Can we generate electricity from within the cities and what market mechanisms we need for that? We also even expand more. It's not only electricity generation, but other uses of energy, like transportation. And this includes private transportation, public transportation, uh, roads, rail, air transportation, shipping. In the region, we need to think a lot about cooling. It's not the same uh, for a high school student to, to study in the, in a room with air conditioner to study in a room without air conditioner. That, that is quite important in terms of equity and in terms of having an actual sustainable uh, society. We are talking about industries, like energy intensive industries. How can we electrify? How can we make that uh, sustainable? We are talking cooking data center, we are talking many, many energy uses. And even more, it's not only about the energy sector, but we have to think on kind of an industrial transition. So what is going to happen, how the electricity companies, the current electricity companies, how they can transform themselves, how they can uh, keep their boss, or, can, or, or how new companies will be created, other companies will be extinguished. That, that is going to affect the, the workers, that is going to have an impact in jobs. We have to think the same, what is the situation of oil and gas companies? They are uh, they can be alive for this transition, they can tra convert themselves or it's gonna be impossible. How, how we do, mining is gonna continue being important, but different type of mining. So how this is gonna be this transformation? What are new areas of growth? Uh, like uh, what is gonna happen, for example, with the automobile in the industries? Automobile factories is not the same for internal combustion vehicles than for electric vehicles. So this is gonna affect like how this uh, this can be an opportunity to create new companies, but it's going to be a threat for others. So that is some area that we have to think. Like in Vietnam, new companies are appearing for electric motorcycles. That would be a, a new industry for, for for the region. Then, and that all these relates to what we call this short and long term trade offs. We if we have the solutions for now. It's going to have an impact in the long term, and it might not be easy to to make both compatible, to align both of them. And that is when I have to talk more about carbon neutrality, not only of the electricity sector, the energy sector, but of an entire economy. Then governments uh, will need to look at to 
green growth strategies or how to green growth not only from environmental perspective but from industrial perspective. Uh, we need to really think about the energy trilemma that yeah it still apply environment equity economics is still important but as the system is changing as the entire system is in a transition we need to start to think more about just transition build back better what is the difference between urban and rural uh, citizens what is the difference between uh, economically advantage our population and the population that is uh, going up and becoming to middle income. We need to think how this new paradigm of digitalization, decarbonization, and decentralization is happening and how new companies are emerging. Like we can talk about uh, Amazon, SoftBank, but uh, there will be also companies in the region that are going to get more involved in the energy sector and they are going to, to change everything. And just uh, one another point is how that also Rana talk about that. There's going to be some solutions that are specific for ASEAN and that will be developed within ASEAN. But ASEAN will be able to learn from other regions, and also we will be able to extract the lesson from ASEAN to other regions. So this this has to be a connection between uh, the very local point, that very uh, municipal level, to the national level, to the regional level, and to the global level. And the last point that I was going to talk about it was a bit more like, what is the role of universities or how how can universities come into something? And for this one, I'm not going to I'm going to leave it as a question mark because I think one of the points universities we have to talk less and we have to listen more. So there is my email and we can talk now in the discussion, but feel free to contact me at any point. You are a star. Thank you, Daniel. You <laughs> you nailed the lightning talk, so well done. This is the point in the agenda today where we go into our first Q&A or as I like to call it, empty chair exercise. The idea of the empty chair is that, you know, if you have a question and you're brave enough, you can turn, put your hand up um, and then I'll ask you and invite you up to the stage to turn your camera and your microphone on and ask your question. Um, but if you're maybe not feeling so brave, do remember you can also put those questions you've been preparing during the table session in the Q&A, but do check first to see if it's already there in case you might want to upvote it if it is already there. So at this point, um, as I said, we're going to be going into talking about the challenges and opportunities moving away from fossil fuels in, uh, to uh, renewable energies in Southeast Asia. And I'd like to welcome back up again Daniel to the stage, as well as Hong Peng Yu, who's the Director of Energy Division at UNESCAP, and Philip Litz, Case Program Expert at Agora Energy Vendor. So if I could invite you, all three of you to turn your cameras and your microphones on. Um, that will be hello Philip welcome hello <laughs> welcome back Daniel and I can see Hong Pen is joining too that's uh, brilliant to have you all here um I'd like to just um give the stage for a moment to first Hong Pen and then to Philip just to say a couple of words about themselves we've obviously already heard from Daniel um but just a little bit about themselves and their interest in the topic um, and their links to the topic so Hong Pen would you like to go first Thank you very much, Rebecca. This is a great opportunity to join you for the discussion. I think RIN21 is really have uh, organized a good uh, uh, event. Uh, even in the past, we, we, we worked with RIN21 for Asia and Pacific, and uh, even jointly public, uh, have a joint publication on renewable energy. And I also see this uh, is a good network with a lot of uh, uh, participation from this country, from Southeast Asia. Uh, in the, regarding the question about challenges and opportunities, I really think uh, for Southeast Asia, energy transition is uh, uh, you know, uh, at the crossroad. Uh, if you look at uh, the Southeast Asia, it's a very good network. You know, the Southeast Asia as an ASEAN, they work together and uh, energy transition is on top of their agenda. Uh, I join the uh, meetings from time to time. I also I have uh, my good uh, friends from different countries in Southeast Asia. I learn a lot from them the ongoing uh, opportunities, challenges for energy transition. But specifically for this, uh, you know, away from fossil fuels to renewable. And uh, I really think uh, this is quite a big you know, topic and also a great challenge. If you look at uh, uh, the Southeast Asia, I think the big challenge is their economic growth is really rely on the fossil fuels. 
uh, if you move away, you really need to find a good option, and which is uh, reliable and also accessible and also uh, this clean. So that, that's really big challenge. I also see you know, the fossil fuel, which include all the fossil fuel, but I think the major challenge for Southeast Asia is the uh, phase out of coal could be the first step instead of all fossil fuels. And so I, I really think uh, this is a big challenge and also there are opportunities. So I think maybe later on I can uh, continue the discussion. But uh, I just put uh, the first point here, it's a really big challenge for Southeast Asia to move away from fossil fuels. Thank you. Thank you, Hong Peng, for that. And Philip, would you like to introduce yourself briefly as well? Yes, of course. Hello, everyone, and thanks to N21 for inviting me to this event. Um, I'm Philip. I come from the German energy, energy transition think tank uh, Agora in Berlin and um, we are part of a bigger consortium which is called CASE um, which uh, also my colleague Sasha will, uh, will later introduce to you and um, we have uh, also an office in Bangkok where we have been especially supporting a lot of our think tank partners in the region um, in the Philippines, Indonesia, in Vietnam where we closely collaborate with them on all topics related to the energy transition with a focus on the power sector and industries. And I'm happy to discuss that all with you in a second. Thank you for that, Philip. So I'm going to just jump straight in with the questions. They're coming through thick and fast. I've got the first one here. It's for you, Daniel. It's picking up on your presentation, I believe. And it's from Sukri Mohamed Noor. And it's, I'm interested in the statement by, for, and from ASEAN. I would like to ask your opinion um, uh, on the strategy to support ASEAN, especially Indonesia, to make the energy transition to renewable energy. So, Daniel, maybe you could share briefly a few sort of a, a few of your thoughts and your thinking behind mm -hmm. that statement. Yeah. So, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Sukri. I think that this uh, this is a very good point. I'm not an uh, expert in Indonesia, so I, I cannot talk too much on what is the Indonesia government policy at this moment. I think, like in the case of Indonesia, like th there are many policies about or many strategies on how to electrify islands or how to move towards sustainable mining that will be quite important and also how to move a country from oil and gas to other industries how to find new opportunities that will be quite important and it will be very relevant uh, i think for outside asean so i would think like uh some countries in in latin america probably they could get many lessons from indonesia in africa i'm not sure but also indonesia could could share those experiences. Like I, I will say, like again, it, this is again called uh, sometimes very concrete on the context. So the Indonesian context and the Laos context are, are very different in some sense. So that is why I said that we need to have the kind of should or fit the solutions for each uh, particular country. But that doesn't mean that there is no relevance for to learn from or to or to export. I think that could be the, the point that I wanted to make and how to support ASEAN. That is, I think that is one we need first to understand what is the situation for countries, communities, and region. So I'm not sure if Hong Pen or Philip they want to, to add something. Hong Peng, Philip, yeah. do you want to add something? We you, you're good to go. Or would you get okay. yeah, Hong Peng? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think uh, this is a good question. Uh, like uh, Indonesia, if you see the uh, composition of uh, energy consumption in Indonesia, coal is still taking the major part of it. And at the same time, uh, Indonesia has also the uh, issues for energy access. You know, uh, I come from the uh, UN, so we, we promote uh, sustainable development goals, especially the, sustain the sustainable development goal seven, which you focus on uh, energy. The, the first thing is universal access by 2030. So for Indonesia, uh, there's a, a, although a big progress for energy access, for, especially for electricity, but uh, as Indonesia is a, a country with a lot of remote and island uh, communities, so how do you meet this uh, uh, demand for energy access uh, without uh, you know, imposing 
the uh, environmental issues, especially through uh, increase of fossil fuels. I really think uh, the challenge is how you meet the energy demand, the electricity demand for those populations. And on the other side, with the renewables. That's a really big challenge for the government. And the, uh, the government needed to have a kind of a strategy to involve all the different stakeholders, especially private sector, to invest in those uh, in, uh, uh, remote communities. But of course, uh, the challenge is also the private sector seeking benefit or profit for this kind of investment, how the government will create enabling environment for the private, uh, private financing for those. And also energy efficiency, I think in Indonesia, it's another areas and with great potential to increase energy efficiency and also to uh, like uh, use alternative energy. And, and that, that is uh, the renewables. I think Indonesia has a, a great uh, a re, uh, potential to explore different kind of uh, renewable energy resources, wind, solar, biofuel, and also geothermal. Probably Indonesia has the largest geothermal resources globally. So how to use it to provide the clean electricity from renewables, that could be a big challenge. But I also see it as an opportunity to meet the, this uh, uh, demand for uh, increased uh, energy uh, from uh, different sectors from the uh, communities. Over. Peng. And um, Philip, do you have anything you'd like to add or should we jump because I can see there's loads of questions coming through um, so unless you've got something sort of additional that you want to add should we jump to the next question okay good right so at this point I would like to ask Simon Unterschutz to turn on his camera and his microphone if he can because he's got a, some an interesting question here um, that is really around how can scientific advisory bodies be better incorporated um, and and um, and I wonder if that might be a question for you, Philip, that you might want to lead on first. Um, Simon, I don't know if you're um, there, but if you do want to turn your camera and your microphone on, feel free. But maybe, Philip, you can sort of jump in and start answering that question. <clears throat> oh, here comes Simon. Oh, Welcome, yeah. Simon. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> uh, yeah, I didn't have the option for that, but now it's on. Um, yes, I, I could uh, say some more words on that question. Um, so. I think the second part is actually that's the most interesting to me. Um, uh, when I think about the experience that we have in, in Germany with a coal exit, we had a, a coal commission, a multi-stakeholder process, and they agreed on an end date, 2038. Um, but now it turned out that uh, we will most likely have a much earlier exit date. However, now politicians say, well, we have a consensus along uh, all stakeholders that say we we will exit 2038. So actually a process that was meant to be very helpful can in the end be counterproductive. And so maybe you can say something about how you see the role of such processes in, in Southeast Asia. And just a second question as well on, on climate governance is uh, of, on scientific advisory bodies and how you think that can be incorporated in the best way. From the German experience, we have it now incorporated in our climate law however, with a rather limited mandate at the moment. So uh, I'd be interested what role you see in, in, in scientific advisory bodies as well. Thank you for that, Simon. So Philip, do you want to uh, answer that? I, I, if you can keep it relatively brief, that would be great. But thank you for coming up to the stage and being brave, Simon, as well. So over to you, Philip. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I will also keep it brief. So let me maybe uh, start first with the question of scientific advisory bodies. Um, in my understanding, scientific advisory bodies can play a very important role in the uh, transition from fossil fuels to renewables because they follow or can, can take over the function of setting the fact base that is absolutely needed for debate. But I would also like to emphasize that this setting the fact base right and getting the numbers right which the whole debate will be based upon is nothing that only can be taken forward by scientific advisory boards it can also be taken forward by companies by uh, science by research and also by civil society especially so this is basically a joint when we're talk, talking about strategy 
one of the key pillars in my understanding of moving forward because there are so many elements that you would need to know um, to, to get the debate right. Like what are, what's the cost structure of the different industries? Where are the people working today? Where might they be working in the future? What is the skill set that workers have? Um, what is uh, the technologies that could be applied in different regions? And getting all this right is really crucial and essential and one of the key pillars to actually moving forward. Otherwise, everybody's talking about something else. The second point regarding stakeholder processes, um, maybe as a background, um, it was already said, Germany has implemented this huge stakeholder process to define the coal phase out and included all kinds of stakeholders from environmental associations, civil societies, the labor movement and companies, and they all agreed on one end date and the needed measures what will be needed uh, or the measures that will be needed to accompany that. Uh, I personally have been working as a negotiator for this commission and so um, I'm obviously a bit biased I guess um, but I see a lot of benefit in this process because it um, was needed among the stakeholders to basically move forward in the discussion but nonetheless I also see that it was an official um, or a very official formal process organized by the government and it only made sense now pointing to Southeast Asia or to different countries it only makes sense if there's a clear decision by the government to actually phase out coal because then everybody knows what, what you're talking about my experiences is also from other countries um, just talking about what might happen is very difficult because um, the discussion might go in all kinds of direction and can't be done very specific. If I think about now, for instance, for the um, take an example for the Philippines, where I believe um, our colleague Red will also talk a bit about later, where there is uh, a huge momentum on uh, uh, um, th that no more coal-fired power plants should be built. This is a clear decision. This is a very clear um, pickup point for the debate where it would make sense now to really get engaged on the question, what does this mean? So there's a clear decision. Now we have a clear open window, window of opportunity to talk. Um, if this is given, then I feel that stakeholder processes have a lot of sense. If there's, if it's very, very blurry, it gets much more difficult. But happy to be challenged on that and discuss this also later with the colleagues from the countries. Thank you so much, Philip. And I should just also say that um, we're going to have informal networking after the event as well. So hopefully if we run out of time and there's still lots of questions unanswered, hopefully you can stay on and network a bit in the rooftop bar as well. So at this point, um, I would like to invite Marianne Franco to turn on her camera and her microphone. And she has... Um, a question for you uh, and Marianne I believe is from the University of Singapore Energy Studies Institute so Marianne uh, don't be shy do please turn on your camera and it might just take a minute okay so I think that Marianne may have had to drop off briefly. Um, so what we're going to do is, I believe we've got uh, Yu Chong Nam from UNOPS, the Energy Transition Partnership, as well, uh, who would like to ask a question. Oh, here comes Marianne. Fantastic. Hello. Welcome, yeah. Marianne. Yeah, um, thank you for the very uh, interesting presentation and discussion and I, kudos to the organizers for having this kind of, you know, um, open discussion. So um, my, my question is really very brief. So for all the speakers, right, aside from the social technical aspects of moving away from fossil fuels, so there are a lot of like tech stuff, right, and even um, the intake of, of, of renewables in the region. How much of an opportunity or barrier is the political context um, in Southeast Asia? So um, the, we have a lot of talks about having political will uh, to change or to, to sustain or to transition into sustainable energy. But how much of it is an opportunity or, or a barrier based from your experience uh, in the region? Marianne, are you, would you like that? to answer that question of a specific panelist or are you interested I mean, in? Yeah, and if, I mean, so Hong Peng, you've got your hand up. Why don't you jump in? Yeah, uh, I think this is a very good question. Uh, uh, for Southeast Asia, uh, compared to other sub region I really think you have a much better kind of uh, like a cooperation level among the government. 
uh, as an ASEAN, you know, you, you organize uh, uh, regularly your energy ministers meeting. I think uh, for those, uh, these recent years, the main discussion is uh, uh, regional cooperation for energy transition. So uh, especially you have this uh, Africa, uh, the uh, ASEAN plan of action for uh, energy cooperation, phase one and now start phase two. It's made a very clear uh, target for uh, renewable energy, 23% by uh, 2025. Uh, I think every country, when they contribute to this regional action plan, they have their also national target to achieve mm -hmm. this uh, uh, regional goal. I really think uh, ASEAN has uh, the mechanism, at least uh, the government to work together to focus on the uh, energy transition through increase the share of renewables. And at the same time, if you see the current situation, there are different kind of a government uh, strategy for uh, uh, to against this COVID-19 pandemics. And there are uh, like a different kind of uh, building back better package, which announced by the government, although it's not, uh, we expected that uh, much green, but at least uh, mm. uh, some of the government already include uh, uh, like a renewable energy into this uh, building back better strategy. Like for example, Vietnam, they have, uh, you know, support this uh, uh, wind and the solar, and Indonesia also include the uh, solar roof as a part of their strategy. I think many other countries are developing this kind of strategy. That's really, you see, compared to other sub region probably ASEAN already committed. So I think probably mm -hmm. the most important is how you implement this target with a different kind of a strategy from investment, from a policy, and also from a technology support. So uh, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Hong Pen. Daniel, Philip, do you have anything to build on that very briefly? Because I'm, I'm just very mindful that we've got another person waiting to come up. Um, anything you want to add? To build if I may say just yeah. something really, yeah. really short that in my experience, political context always change. It evolves quite fast. So it's really up to build that political vision or societal vision. I don't know how to explain that. It's society is pressuring. If there is the industry is moving for that, a politics will accompany. It's very tough from a political point of view to enforce something that everybody is against. Mm -hmm. But when that movement is created, I think that political context will just change, and it changed quite fast in my that's my experience. Thank you very much, Marianne, for being bold and coming up to the stage and asking a question. Um, at this point, um, I'd like to invite uh, Chong to come up to the stage. So, if Chong, if you'd like to turn your camera and your microphone on. Um, and in the meantime, I'd like to ask our panelists as well, just to look in the chat. There is one question that I don't think we're going to get to around regulatory brockages. And therefore, I wonder if you might want to share some of your thoughts in the chat uh, once we've wrapped up this, this Q&A empty chair session. So I just invite you to take a quick look at that. So welcome, Chong. It's great to have you here. Um, would you like to uh, jump in and ask your question? Thank you, Rebecca. Yes, uh, I would like to ask my questions uh, to Hong Peng as well, if you don't mind. And my question would be uh, broadly covering the two questions. First would be that the role of private finance on offering the early opportunities for phasing out from fossil fuels. And given that there are many developing partners who are ready to support this initiative, how can we deliver a coordinated action? And what is the UNSCAP's role here? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Yi Chung, for the question. Yeah, uh, as I mentioned earlier, private financing is very important and also crucial for energy transition. Uh, we have done some studies for uh, Asia and Pacific and also include the Southeast Asia. Uh, with the energy financing, uh, transition financing, there is a great gap. You know, if you look at the uh, face out of a core, even not a fossil fuel, even only face out of a core, it needs a great finance and the investment. And also to achieve SDG 7, I think that's exactly the energy transition we need to, you know, first step to meet uh, the goals on SDG 7. 
and which include uh, energy access, renewable energy, energy efficiency. We estimate uh, for Asian Pacific, uh, we need about uh, uh, 1.3, around the 1 to 1.3 trillion US dollars until 2030. That, that is really a big challenge, you know, for the financing part. And there's, if you think about the public fund, it's difficult to meet this demand. The private financing is really a, a great need. But as you said, uh, what are the early kind of opportunities for this private financing? I really think uh, because the private sector, you have the, uh, the, the investment, and also the technology is mainly from the private sector, the market. So how do you work together with the government? I think under this uh, uh, clear target, I think it should set up by the government, and like I said, the clear uh, renewable energy target, the clear target for energy access and energy efficiency. When you have the clear target, so that we would give the signals to the private sector to invest in this area to meet the target. I think that, that, that is how you, know, you work with the government. The private financing, uh, given the large amount of uh, assets management by private financing sector, you know, uh, we have our study estimate about uh, 50, 50 trillion for the uh, developing Asia Pacific region. It's from the private sector. So the challenge will be how to redirect the funds to sustainable development, especially to the energy transition sector. With the innovative financing, financing instrument, I think that's an early kind of opportunity for private sector to demonstrate, you know, what will be the innovative mechanism you know, for energy transition. So that could be also, you know, take the risk. Of course, the government has a responsibility to minimize the risk. So that's where I also want to emphasize the public-private partnership, you know, to just share the risk and with the private financing, with the government strategy and policy, and with the benefits, you know, for the communities to get benefit from this uh, uh, financing. And the private sector also play a crucial role. Uh, you know, if you look at the renewable energy project uh, globally, and in Asia Pacific, there's no exception. The large amount of investment is from the private sector. And also the government must develop a clear policy framework. That's what I said, long-term, and give this kind of clear, clear guidance and also mechanism and for the private sector to minimize the risk. And also another thing I think, uh, maybe the private financing will come if the government have the carbon finance. You know, the, that is also a lot of a discussion about the pricing on carbon. So that's also enlarged the market for private, private sector financing. And your second question is also very good, how you know, there's a lot of development partners in this region, how this could be coordinated approach. It, it's really very difficult. <laughs> there's no any agency can do this, but every agency want to do this. So I really think we should have a network to at least uh, exchange information to work together rather than duplication of uh, efforts. Uh, for ESCAP, uh, uh, we, we worked with many the uh, member countries. This is, a, you know, we have the main function to provide the intergovernmental platform for countries to come together to just uh, share about their challenges and also their strategies for energy transition. We have our energy committee, which is specifically share you know, from the member countries about their needs, their strategy, and their plan for energy transition. I also think this could be also a platform for development partners to join together to provide this information to member states, let them clearly know the overall picture at this region, how they approach different development partners to get the support, the financial support, technical support, and also Capacity building, I think that's also more important for the developing countries for energy transition. And at the same time, I'm, I also think it could be uh, the development partners network. That could be also very important. If we regularly can work and meet each other to share the information and also to uh, come up with uh, uh, like a different strengths from the different developed partners to provide the support for 
uh, members in this region, countries in this region. That will provide a probably more uh, coordinated approach. And also that will give much more access for the countries in this region in Southeast Asia to get uh, the support they need. Thank you. This, thank you, Hongpen. This seems like a really good place, actually, with a good kind of ambition to wrap up this panel for now. Um, it, I thank you, Chong, for coming up and asking the question. Thank you to Daniel for your presentation being part of the panel and to Hongpen and Philip as well. Um, and we look forward to, don't forget, there are a couple of questions. There's one from Jürgen in the q and It'd be great if you could put some comments in the chat to him. I believe Roman also wanted to ask a question. Unfortunately, out of time so maybe Roman if you could put your question in the Q&A as well um, our, our panelists can pick up on it and 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 write their thoughts in the chat as well so thank you very much to you all um, and uh, at this point what I'd like to ask you to do is turn off your cameras and your microphones um, so um, we have uh, a short film now coming up um, REN21 uh, has um, got uh, two partners um, in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, core partners, and the first of these is, uh, is ETP, and unfortunately, um, Sipa Javanpa, who is the exec director of ETP, couldn't make today's session. She will be here at the next session, um, but uh, could not make today. And so she has uh, provided us with this very short film that we'd like uh, to show you now. So if I could ask the team to roll the film now, that would be great. Welcome to the first rendezvous of REN21. At Energy Transition Partnership, we treasure these wonderful opportunities to take the conversation on the pathways forward and to openly discuss challenges to energy transition in the region. My name is Sirpe Ervenpä, and I am director of the Southeast Asia Energy Transition Partnership. Originally President Macron's idea, ETP is a unique consortium of governments of France, United Kingdom, Canada and Germany, and philanthropic organizations of Children's Investment Fund Foundation, IKEA Foundation, Sequoia Climate Fund, High Tide and others, and the United Nations Office for Project Services as ETP's fund manager. The funders of ETP had a vision that a consortium like ETP that represents diverse partners under a common drive can make a bold difference to achieve low carbon energy systems in the region. Let me turn to our topic of the day, Southeast Asia is the only region in the world where if policy and investments continue as business as usual, coal and other fossil fuels will continue to grow for decades and can wipe out the energy transition gains achieved globally. On the other hand, the region also showcases massive potential for renewable energy and energy efficiency, promising new opportunities, jobs, economic development and a thriving green Asia. As we know, the region is heavily reliant on coal and fossil fuels for energy production and has far too many plans to build more of such assets, risking to become stranded assets and burdening liabilities. This financial and environmental disaster in waiting need not happen. Our topic today is particularly relevant as we aim to make the space available for renewable energy through exit strategies from fossil fuels and entry strategies for renewables in the region. With energy demand in the region expected to double by 2035, Southeast Asia needs to rapidly ramp up public and private investments in renewable energy and energy efficiency to ensure a clean and healthy future for the region and the world. At ETP, we seek to Co collaborate and collaboration opportunities to work with all of you on abatement scenarios, adjusting policies to reduce coal and fossil fuels and increase renewables in energy production. As a first step, ETP is implementing a program in response to Energy Transition Council's request to develop a synthesis of coal abatement scenarios in Vietnam to provide a sound option to coal for meeting the rapidly growing demand in the country. This is just one of many examples of how ETP will deliver value and operationalize discussions like this one today. We need to get into the details of the policy frameworks that impede the renewable investments and undermine viability, such as fossil fuel subsidies, 
and uncosted externalities. And we need to move the administrative barriers for Southeast Asian countries for accessing finance for policy adjustments and physical investments needed to modernize the grids and develop renewable energy. We need solid pathways for coal phase out, knowledge based abatement scenarios that are championed by country leaders. Political will will certainly be a key. Many countries have achieved tremendous success when the political will has been broad based and the leadership is focused on implementing rapid transformation. We can achieve it here in Southeast Asia for energy transition. The Asian miracle of poverty reduction is an example for this. And so are the many efforts by the development partners, governments and private sector to participate in a conversation like this one organized by REN21. Thank you for joining and welcome to the REN21 rendezvous event on strategizing energy transition in Southeast Asia. So that was a very short film from REN21's uh, partner ETP. At this point, I would like to um, invite Sasha Opoa, Case Program Manager at Deutsche Gesellschaft für Internationale Zusammenarbeit. Gosh, that's quite a mouthful, Sasha, isn't it? I think we just call it GIZ, shall we? <laughs> Let's go with GIZ, yeah, but, but many thanks for um, at least giving a try at the German acronym. Uh, you managed quite well. Thank you. So I'd like to invite you just to say a few words um, to the participants. Yeah, thank you very much. And also many thanks to, to REN21 for giving us the opportunity to um, participate. Um, we're very much looking forward to embark on this journey for the Rendezvous series together with, with ETP and um, REN21. And I'm very happy to share a few words about CASE, the, the program that I'm working for as program coordinator to give you an insight into how we feel is the like our best approach um, to tackle the challenges um, in, in the energy transition in Southeast Asia. And uh, I'm going to share um, just a few slides as visual aid. Um, all right. So it should be up. And Rebecca, could you indicate if you see the slide? can see the slides. Perfect, thank you. Um, so yeah, um, CASE is uh, short for Clean, Affordable and Secure uh, Energy for Southeast Asia. It's a program funded by the German Ministry for Environment, um, Nature Safety and uh, Nature Conversation and Nuclear Safety. And um, we're aiming um, to work in four countries. That's uh, Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines and Thailand. Um, and our objective or the objective of this program to work on the narrative or the discourse um, around the energy transition in all these four countries and also at regional level. Um, and Serpa had touched upon it in her uh, input. So uh, in order to get there, um, sort of these um, discussions need to be based uh, or have a very strong and solid um, knowledge base. Um, so that's why we're putting um, specific emphasis on um, providing yeah, evidence and research to get there, um, but also aiming to include the stakeholders that are needed to get there. So you would think of the uh, energy sector um, stakeholders, the ministries of energies and um, grid providers or grid um, yeah, of, of, of these four countries, but we are also trying to include others, for example, environmental actors, ministries of of the environment in these countries or also other ministries, but also um, including the CSOs and NGOs um, in this discord to really ensure um, there's a, a perspective shared from different actors um, to get there. Um, so this is what we're um, setting out um, and how to get there um, is with um, this kind of approach. Um, Daniel mentioned, um, I think, before that, uh, of course, you need to understand the local context and to understand the local context, you best work, of course, with the people from these countries. So um, we're very, very happy that um, within case, it's not just GIZ, but there's a, a whole range of other um, think tanks also part of um, this approach. Um, so the sort of general idea is to have um, at least one think tank from each country. Um, being part of the program. I'm very happy and looking forward to, to read from um, ICSC 
um, in just a couple of minutes um, to yeah, share his thoughts and, and insights. Um, and we also have other think tanks from, from the other countries. And we're joined by um, two think tanks from Germany. They're working um, globally and you've already had the pleasure of meeting Philip um, just some minutes ago. Um, yeah, and we feel that um, by working with uh, local um, think tanks from the region, um, but also with think tanks um, working globally, we can make sure that um, the opportunities are looked into from the local context, that the initiatives to tackle them are rooted um, in their countries. But we do also manage to share experiences across the region and also with um, yeah, other country cases. Um, this is just a very brief um, overview of how we feel um, we can um, best approach the energy transition challenges of, of these days. Um, again, many thanks to REN21 for making this happen, um, this series, um, and very much looking forward to the rest of the event. And thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sasha, for that um, overview. Um, I should also say that hopefully, Sasha, you will be around for the networking piece afterwards. Um, as we know, um, uh, Sipa couldn't make it today, but a couple of her colleagues, uh, Chong, who spoke um, earlier, and uh, Prepan uh, Intapanya of ETP are also going to be available for afterwards. Or if you prefer, if you've got a run, you can also send emails. We'll make sure that we, we share emails as well. So thank you very much for that. Um, and at this point, I'd like to um, invite our second speaker for today up to the stage. We've got Rebecca Burns from uh, Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation. Wow, that's also quite a powerful non-proliferation treaty joining us on the stage. Um, welcome, Rebecca. I've got to, I've got to say it to Rebecca. <laughs> Who'd have thought? <laughs> It's great to have you here, um, you know, and to you. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm just going to share some slides. So just get those up and get them ready. And hopefully you can see those now. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, as Rebecca mentioned, I work with the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty Initiative, which is indeed quite a mouthful, so we often use fossil, a fossil fuel treaty for short. Um, and really my goal today is to set the scene for the second half of today's workshop by thinking through the role of international cooperation and also the importance of tackling the supply side of fossil fuels when we talk about the transition to renewable energy. Uh, so I'll just start by noting that fossil fuels account for over 75% of global greenhouse gas emissions and nearly 90% of carbon dioxide emissions. Um, but according to the Production Gap Report, which is jointly produced by the UN Environment Programme, Stockholm Environment Institute and several other major research institutions, current country production plans are more than double what we can extract if we want to have any chance of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees. And now this is starting to be quite widely recognised. Uh, in May, the International Energy Agency released its first fully fleshed out 1.5 degree consistent scenario. And they found in that scenario that um, beyond projects that are already committed in 2021, there is no new, uh, no need for new oil and gas projects or new coal mines or mine extensions in order to meet the world's energy needs going forward. And actually, it's likely that we have to go even further than that. So this chart is uh, some analysis from Oil Change International and was actually backed up by some recent work um, by Sven Teske, who will speak to us shortly, um, which shows that even if we stop expanding fossil fuels, there's already enough carbon in the fossil fuel reserves that are under production at the moment to push the world far beyond 1.5 degrees and make it impossible to achieve our global obligations under the Paris Agreement. So I'm sure many of you know this, but it's, you know, it's quite a, a challenging situation um, when it comes to looking at the production side of fossil fuels. But one of the challenges that we face is so far the majority of the efforts at the national level and international level only focus on the emissions end and the demand side. And while this is obviously incredibly important, uh, the Paris Agreement doesn't mention coal, oil or gas even once. And this has allowed the fossil fuel industry to continue to expand significantly. And actually, as Sofa mentioned in her video just now, basically this, this undermines all of the, the efforts that have been taken on the, the emissions and demand side of the equation. 
Uh, so just a bit of context. In this context, I'm working with an organization um, that's working with a global network of around 580 organizations based around the world, and many of them in Southeast Asia, that are focused on mobilizing civil society and country governments around the objective of a global treaty that will complement the Paris Agreement uh, through a coordinated approach to phasing out fossil fuels uh, fairly and equitably. And the foundation of that regime, we hope, would be firstly to uh, phase out, um, uh, to stop expansion of new fossil fuels, phase out existing production. And I think what's really relevant for today's conversation is to ensure a peaceful, just and equitable transition um, away from fossil fuels for all countries and communities. And on this point, um, we have a program of work uh, underway that's being led by my colleague Nicholas, who's in the audience today. So what does all this mean for Southeast Asia? Well, at a macro level, and not to steal Sven's thunder, because he'll be able to speak to this better than I can, but just to say that he um, produced a report recently which shows that it is possible to meet the world's energy needs with renewable energy and to do that while phasing out fossil fuels fast enough to stay within 1.5 degrees. But we know that doing this is going to take an unprecedented amount of resources. And um, in order for this transition to occur, it needs to be fair and equitable. And when we look at the countries uh, within Southeast Asia, it's quite clear that they cover the whole spectrum in terms of different types of dependence on fossil fuels when we look at the production side of the scale. Um, and so there are a variety of different challenges and opportunities for that region. Uh, so for example, um, if you look at this chart, it shows the level of dependence on oil for the share of government revenue along the bottom axis and the capacity to transition away from fossil fuel production in terms of GDP per capita on the left. And you can see here that both Timor-Leste and Brunei, for example, have very high levels of dependence on oil. And the same goes for gas. Um, Malaysia and Myanmar aren't on this chart, but they also have relatively high levels of dependence as well. And this second chart here looks at a uh, level of um, dependence of, of the workforce on coal production. And Indonesia is a major player in this chart. Um, and while it has, you know, it's, it's got relatively low capacity compared to some other countries, sort of a mid-level, low level of dependence, but just in absolute terms, as the fifth largest producer in the world, um, the challenge of phasing out production of coal in Indonesia is going to be a huge effort and it takes a lot of you know, sort of investment. And so this is really important to take into account when you are considering uh, the transition on the demand side of the equation, because there's a huge amount of potential revenue that's being impacted by the transition away from production. Um, so I guess this is all just to say that the transition to renewable energy in many countries in Southeast Asia isn't just a technical question, but for some of these countries, it's also a matter of reducing reliance on fossil fuels for economic development. And I think this is really important because, um, as you probably well know, Southeast Asia is quite an economic powerhouse and, you know, which is really exciting in terms of the growth and development opportunities in the region, but also has the potential to lock in significant greenhouse gas emissions and continued fossil fuel production. But I think the good news is um, a lot of the region isn't already locked in significantly or, or fully to fossil fuel infrastructure in terms of the generation side of things. And so obviously there's the capacity to leapfrog to renewables and to do this with enough planning and foresight to avoid the, that stranded asset risk. And there are already some really good examples in the region we can learn from. I'm sure many of you know, um, you know, uh, many more, but one example is Vietnam's uh, feed-in tariff, which has helped uh, with rooftop roof solar uptake, for example. And as this kind of economic powerhouse, the uh, symbolic value of Southeast Asia taking the lead on transitioning away from fossil fuel production and generation at the same time would be really uh, you know, it, tremendous in terms of the, the global impact um, that that would have. And so finally, I'd just like to, uh, having kind of laid the scene and, and, and looked at the supply side of the equation and how that might link to um, some of the, the development challenges that then feed into the ability to invest in the demand side transition, I just wanted to remark on the importance of international cooperation in achieving um, these dual aims of the supply and demand side transition. So it's really clear that this is gonna be a massive amount of work. For some countries, they face the prospect of having to phase down production and therefore find other sources of government revenue. But at the same time, we need to deploy renewable energy technology at a massively increased scale to what we are now, something like four to five times current rates of investment. And so none of this is really able to happen unless we bring international cooperation and multilateralism into play 
And um, we argue that a multilateral regime has many benefits. It can create diplomatic pressure for rich countries to move first and provide support to those countries with less capacity and including some countries within the Southeast Asian region to be able to enable them to transition. It can institutionalize this idea of fair shares and equity in climate finance and, and, and ensuring that support flows to where it needs to. It can um, mandate 100% renewable energy pathways for all countries globally, and then provide a platform for knowledge sharing and best practice to meet these targets and including, for example, you know, feed-in tariffs and other measures. It can provide a platform for regional and South-South cooperation, which I think Southeast Asia really has a strong um, possibility of excelling in and already has really strong institutional frameworks there to build on. It can mandate a shifting of subsidies from fossil fuels to renewables and finally um, has the ability to build a global evidence base of best practice policy and technological innovations to help with that leapfrogging um, to renewable energy technology on the demand side. So that's there's just a few remarks from you know our our organization's perspective um and i'll leave it there and i really look forward to the rest of the conversation thank you thank you very much rebecca and um yes so that's great you shared your details there as well so what we're going to do at this point is we are going to go into a second uh q a or empty chair um session and uh joining rebecca on the stage are going to be red uh constantino except Institute for Climate and Sustainable Cities, and Sven Teska, expert on fossil fuel exit strategy uh, at the University of Technology in Sydney. So if the both of you would like to, Red and Sven, turn your cameras and your microphones on and join us on the stage, that would be fantastic. And I already have a first question um, from uh, a participant who I'd also like to invite to turn on her camera and join the stage. Uh, whilst um, Red and Sven, maybe you can just put yourselves on mute. I'm getting a bit of feedback. Um, whilst Red and Sven, you introduce yourself and that person is Th Tharinya Supaza, project lead of CASE. So Tharinya, do feel free to turn your camera on. Uh, maybe Red, you'd like to go first and just say a little bit about yourself and your interest and link to the, this, this issue. Hello, Rebecca. Um, I'm based in Manila. My name is Red Constantino. Um, uh, I am part of uh, an, uh, an international policy group the institute for climate and sustainable cities and we've been working on energy policy across many other issues as well over um, the last few years transport finance adaptation as well thank you thanks red and sven over to you thanks uh, my name is uh, sven Teska. i'm an associate professor at the university of technology sydney at the institute for sustainable futures my um core work is uh, around energy scenarios and uh, energy pathways for countries, regions, industry sectors, everything, um, and uh, therefore more, more, more or less related to uh, energy transition, but the more the technical side of 100% uh, renewable energy concepts. Thanks, Sven. Um, so at this point, Maybe I could ask you just to put your microphone on mute, Sven, getting a little bit of feedback. Um, but at this point, um, welcome, Therenia, as well, to the stage um, and to this session. And um, over to you, really, to ask your question. Hi, hello, everyone. So uh, I'm Therenia from Ekohar, Energy Vendor. And yeah, maybe just the first questions to everyone is like, um, so what do you see like the for the fossil fuel um, in Southeast Asia and the entry strategy into the renewable energies. So who'd like to jump in first on, on Therinia's question? Or maybe you need to ask for a bit more clarification, but who'd like to who'd like to step up first? Reg, shall I shall I hand to you first? Sure. Um, thanks, Sarina, for the for the question. Um, several answers, uh, and I'll be I'll try to be very quick. Um, first one: uh, Southeast Asians to lead, and so um, uh, for instance, uh, in the panel, um, I think we would have enjoyed uh, more Southeast Asians 
um, because there was a question, for instance, from uh, on Indonesia, and it would have been great for an Indonesian to answer that as well. Um, not only Southeast Asians, we can also do even better if we can have more women from Southeast Asia, uh, because that uh, our colleagues can, can add to this. Um, the second is, um, uh, I think, uh, very personal. It has to do with passion and patience. I've known Sven for, uh, uh, what, 20 years then? Um, uh, I first worked with him in 2001. He was already working on uh, helping support Southeast Asian campaigns in 1998. Uh, and so, um, being that it takes forever, it have to be patient. We have to manage ourselves. Everything matters, everything counts. And that incrementally, everything adds up. And so, you don't expect changes to happen in two years. You need to um, invest time in building relations. And you never, you shouldn't be arrogant in, in thinking that um, uh, you know more uh, than what government uh, as well. We all need to work together in order to deliver some than what our campaigns are, uh, especially because an energy transition is going to be very difficult. Um, some speakers earlier and what it's doing already. Um, my recollection of, uh, uh, of Germany is whenever I'm there in uh, negotiations over the climate treaty, um, I only need to look back, uh, uh, especially when I'm in Bonn, and I see massive coal barges uh, uh, floating by. And so if it's Germany with one of the smartest scientific uh, minds uh, uh, heading it, uh, the biggest economy in Europe, uh, having difficulty in making this transition, Southeast Asia will obviously have the same uh, uh, difficulty because it's not a joke to uproot um, fossil capital, not just energy, from from our uh, uh, our own economies, decarbonization is. We often think it, uh, think it is, and it's not just about um, electricity. Um, another point is that I think, um, especially with uh, regard to what I said about Sven, and I can certainly say that as well about REN21. Encountered and worked with REN21 over two decades ago. This thing, amazing, and uh, uh, has helped a lot of uh, other groups. Um, Currently, we live in exciting times. I don't think Sven or I would have expected that we would see an actual time when a moratorium on uh, green would be issued by the Asia and that Vietnam uh, would be making gigantic strides in terms of solar and offshore wind advances. These would not have happened without civil society pressure, but also work with business, private sector, think tanks from the academe and government who actually will have um, a lot of officials across agencies that support an energy transition, except they need to balance that with their mandate to move development um, uh, objectives forward. This actually is a point. When we talk about the energy transition, we need to make sure that we speak to government objectives as well, because it's not necessarily uh, that uh, energy and climate are the most important uh, in the agenda items of governments in Southeast Asia. Climate change is the biggest crisis there is, but it is not as more important necessarily if you compare it with poverty, with education, shelter, jobs, and so on. We need to speak to what government is aiming at. And in this case, win-win solutions are actually beneficial to us because we see what the people need and maybe not because our contribution to the climate crisis is because of development objectives that are being furthered. For instance, in mobility, active mobility, if we move people instead of cars and we ensure that our economies are run by the majority uh, of, uh, of our people who are commuters, we actually get to contribute to the global climate uh, uh, fight because we reduce emissions not because it's the main aim, but because we want to make our economies more efficient. The same is true with electricity as well. Electricity, if we make it more reliable and affordable and secure, will actually produce bigger gains in terms of decarbonization because it's vital and flexible generation that is the most important strategic elements in terms of an energy transition. And lastly, I think, and there's more to add, you know, in terms of batteries and so on, Moving forward, 
I think it's very important to acknowledge that we will eventually land on the right landing zone in terms of a clean energy powered economy. That is not the challenge. Let's get there sooner. And can we avoid five, seven, ten years of long campaigns if we can arrive sooner and give the benefit of clean energy to the working families across the region? We can do that, but other actors need to play their part as well. Multilateral development banks cannot expect us to transition even as they continue to fund fossil gas, for instance, or even coal interests across the region. Things have to change together, and if we can't do this together, we will fail together as well. And that's not a Thank you for that, Red, and I appreciate that. And I should just say that Suyukri has also put a comment in the chat to me about uh, Indonesia and the problem, uh, you know, it's very important to provide energy and electricity for people, especially in 12,500 villages without good quality electricity. So, and I, so the transition strategy only for power generation systems for big and medium cities, not for all, for all people of country like Indonesia, for example. I said only Indonesia due to this country being the biggest in ASEAN. Just so she just wanted to clarify that bit. So, but thank you, Red, for calling out a couple of important issues there as well around representation in these sessions. I know that Rana has touched on it, but this is a pilot and we are, it's a work in progress and we are definitely picking up on all the feedback. So keep the feedback coming, please. So out of uh, Rebecca, Sven, do you want to build on what Red has all, already said? We've got, as you can see in the chat, we're, in the Q&A, we've got a lot of questions coming through. So if there's something you'd like to say, maybe Rebecca or Sven, turn your uh, microphones on. Um, yep, Sven, over to you. Yeah, um, yeah. Red and me are working together now 20 years and actually the first time I did something on renewables in Southeast Asia was in 1997, so that's a long time ago. Um, the situation right now luckily is different. Uh, the good news is that renewable electricity mainly but also renewable heat to some extent is actually the cheapest option. So um, the, re the, the price is only one issue or one topic in the energy transition. And um, I actually left my home country, Germany, now six, almost seven years ago. Um, and I stopped using Germany as a good example because I'm deeply embarrassed of what Germany did in the last 10 years in the energy transition. It, get no, it got nowhere. And, um, and the, the so-called um, coal phase out in 2038, is, it's laughable and it's a disaster and it's not economic. So what is the reason behind that? The reason behind that is twofold. First, the coal industry, um, like the car industry in Germany, has a very long tradition of being the industrial back backbone of the country. So when we talk about energy supply, when we talk about industry policy, and that's the same, the same is true for, um, for Southeast Asian countries, we, we cannot forget the reality of the industry in that country and the workforce. Because electricity, the cost of electricity is only one out of many, many other criteria. If, if we would follow the logic that once renewables are cheaper, they will just wipe out fossil fuels, then fossil fuels would have been wiped out three years ago. So it is not the case. Um, renewables are cheaper as, and still we see more and more projects. I see actually a problem arising for Southeast Asia in terms of stranded assets. Lots of new coal power plants and coal projects and gas projects are coming up. They are already more expensive than um, new built solar and wind. And the resources of, uh, across Southeast Asia are just marvelous. Philippine had, the Philippines has one of the best wind resources in the region. Uh, the, Vietnam has a, a, a wind resource, offshore wind resource, where you can almost uh, provide baseload power. Um, we have uh, uh, in uh, Indonesia, for electrification of Indonesia, you actually have no other choice than solar because there are 12,000 islands. They will never be grid connected um, in sort of over one large grid with coal power plants. That's impossible. So what we have to take into account is the reality of the society there and the industry policy. We need to implement or need to combine energy policy and industry policy in order to actually provide a concept for a specific country. 
and good examples, um, and that's my experience over the last decade now, um, a good example almost is, is almost uh, counterproductive if it's from a country where um, it's seen totally different. So for example, if I say as a, uh, as a German, look at Germany, um, they, is, they, they did something good to a Southeast Asian country. This country has absolutely no relation to, that, uh, to Germany. They don't see themselves as, uh, as sort of equal partner. While if we have good examples, for example, from Bangladesh, showing that to uh, another developing countries, that makes sense. So we basically need to combine the ideas and the experiences of equal, of sort of countries which have something in common um, in order to, to make it work. And uh, my plea is in the whole development of, of um, policy, we don't need to forget, we should not forget that the civil society needs to be able to contribute on renewable energy projects. Because if other large scale investors come into the country, maybe foreign investors, and build large facilities for renewable energy, they will experience a pushback because they did not take, to, uh, they have no connection to the local environment, to the local people. So we actually, policies need to take that into account. And the um, tendering systems, for example, um, wiped out a lot of small and medium enterprises. And that is lessons learned. We should not actually repeat those, uh, those mistakes because it has been proven to be counterproductive. Thank you for that, Sven. Um, so some very powerful points made there by both you. And so Rebecca, do you want to add to this or should we thank Farinha and jump to the next question? I read and Sven have done an excellent job of covering the point. Brilliant. Okay, so we'll come to you next on the on the on the next question. So thank you, Therinia, very much for for that. There is a question that has been upvoted more than any other in the Q and A. It's by Jurgen Lawrence. So Jurgen, I don't know if you want to turn your camera on and ask this question um, to um, our panelists. So I'm just going to give Jurgen a moment come up to the stage. In the meantime, you might want to have a look at it. It's in the Q&A. It's uh, regulatory blockages by government and fossil industry preventing needed um, scale up or, of transitions uh, towards renewable. So here we come. I'll let Jürgen ask the question. He's going to do it far better than I can. So over to you. Oh, Jürgen, we've lost you. You dropped off. Jürgen, are you there? No. Okay. I'll, I'll, I, oh, I just, here we go. Yeah, here he comes. I just want to support, <laughs> uh, fully support the statements of Sven. Uh, he's absolutely right. I'm totally disgruntled about the, the space and the, the actions in Germany. Uh, we wanted to be a leader in tra transition, but since more than 10 years, we, we only see blockages. But I also see the blockages here in Asia, especially in the Philippines, where energy transition is really blocked through government and vested interest uh, from the existing fossil side. Uh, so we uh, today, we since five years, we have uh, solar and wind are the cheapest energy sources. So there shouldn't be any blockage anymore to fully scale up implementation of those um, technologies. So why, why is it not happening? Uh, maybe we see it now in, in Vietnam. Vietnam is a good example where we have uh, more than 10 gigawatts uh, established within three years. In the Philippines, we, we are below two gigawatt um, after 15 years. So uh, here uh, there are major differences. But what I also sense here in Asia, the, the consciousness is really not there uh, of the urgency we, we need to transition. Actually, and that's my biggest concern because we already see tipping effects, uh, worldwide tipping effects from the polar, from, from the tundra in Siberia um, are kicking in, um, also from the Gulf Stream, uh, from the, the oceans, which create really um, looming disasters, which, which are mind, will be mind blowing. And, and what we see right now is really just the beginning. So in that context, I think um, the, the governments are really not in the, in the in the in the mind frame and mindset uh, of this urgency uh, to act 
that's really not there. And everybody is talking and have nice talks and saying, okay, in the next 20 years we do something, but absolutely we know it's not enough and we will not achieve the goals. We will have more than four degrees temperature increases. And what that means, I think all the scientists know what will happen then to the world. So uh, in, yeah. that, in that phase, uh, I think we cannot wait anymore. So, and, and really, I, I yeah. see really the vested interest is the main problem. So thank you for that, Jürgen. Do you, you. do you want to ask your question or um, that you you had? Because no, I, I, I want that, a yeah. big comment. Yeah, a comment, a sharing insight. Like thank you yeah. for that, then, Jürgen. Um, so um, at this point, um, I would like to um, invite up uh, Dos. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to pronounce this incorrectly, by the way. Dos Sus susu to come up to the stage um if he is uh is available to join um to ask his question um and if not if he is not there i know that roman vakulchuk Va Va Vakulchuk has been um waiting patiently to ask a question as well so maybe roman if you want to turn your camera on and ask the question if uh, Dossa is not available, I would be grateful. Otherwise, I am literally just going to jump to um, the next question in in the Q and A, um, uh, which is around. Um, what are the steps policymakers should take in order to develop more clean coal technology in ASEAN? Rebecca, do you want to pick up on that one? Or would Sven, what would you, you get, Rebecca, do you want to? Sure, I mean, I, I probably don't have too much to, to I, I guess what I will say, and then I'll, I'll pass to Sven is, um, you know, really appreciate the question. I think though, what, we are seeing with the science and kind of recent analysis is that unfortunately there isn't really a space for any new fossil fuel projects um, going forward. It's quite clear that, you know, we already have too many fossil fuels under production and too much, um, you know, too many um, operating generation plants worldwide. And as much as um, you know, I understand the desire to try and make uh, the existing um, generation more efficient, there's always the risk of locking in uh, to say clean coal technology or, or generation technology that has a lifespan of 50 years or, or, or aroundabouts um, that we really can't afford to lock into. And so I think it's really important at this point in time that we turn the conversation to how do we shift to 100% renewable energy and start to phase down the projects that we already have. And it's a really challenging conversation to have. And I think that's that you know really important to acknowledge. It's not an easy thing to ask. And particularly when we're talking about um, you know, in countries where there may not be 100% access to renewable and uh, to energy at all, or their, you know, their sort of, um, you know, major financial costs associated with that transition. But in terms of the sort of um, existential threat that climate change poses, it, it just is essential that we start to talk, you know, focus on renewables and not on trying to make fossil fuels more efficient would be my um, reaction to that. But I'm sure Sven has a little bit more to add on that as well. Ben. Yeah, not much to add. Um, clean coal had uh, its time in the conversation uh, between uh, like the early 90s, early to late 90s. Um, that's gone. Um, what we need to do now is we need to decarbonize um, within the next um, 20 years the electricity sector. And um, there is actually no such thing as clean coal. And um, the good news is solar and wind electricity is um, significantly cheaper than conventional coal and significantly cheaper than um, any other coal, which might be developed, but uh, it never took off. And it was, was actually or ended up clean coal, the term ended up as a DR uh, statement, uh, which was actually buried in the global discussions about 10 years ago. I haven't heard that term for a long time. Can I jump in? Sure. Yeah, um, uh, I think it's very important to make the point that governments or companies will not make decisions out of uh, moral considerations. Um, I'm pretty sure they're aware, even uh, especially the most honest ones uh, in uh, among the corporate directors of uh, 
but the businesses are better to maximize profit. And therein lies the key, because I think, as Ven had also said uh, uh, earlier, that the challenge is how to make the business case that the transition needs to happen sooner rather than later. Because if you're a company, um, your fortunes are not going to grow and they are likely to sink. And the question is how fast they sink if you remain on trajectory, even if you abandon coal and move towards um, or gas. In the case of the Philippines, it was mentioned earlier, that we are making a mistake whereby we are locking in um, a the future of the country towards um, a, a, an option in fossil gas that is likely going to have a massive impact in terms of um, the, the economy because of the preference for uh, combined cycle gas turbines, which is going to replace, only replace uh, coal as base load, but it's not going to solve the problem. And the case against coal, whether you call it new detergent coal or clean coal, is actually not just about uh, the, the the myth that there's no such thing as, as clean coal. It's the fact that our economies require something that is different from the obsolete um, framework where you provide massive base load with the thinking it will be solved. That's not the case in the Philippines. We've been encountering in the last few years, even before the pandemic, but also during the pandemic, massive persistent outages that are merely big statements saying that coal is actually the opposite of what they're uh, uh, making themselves to be. It is coal that is expensive and unreliable. And in the case of the economy, what is preventing the modernization of the electricity? Because right now, I think in the case, it's the same as well. We have an excess of rigid inflation especially baseload technologies, in particular coal, that is creating mass the grid. Because what we need is for our power to match the demand. And right now, coal really cannot do that. Whether you make it the cleanest of all the cleanest detergent coals is not going to matter because what we need is flat. That is what our demand is. And coal cannot do that. And certainly nuclear cannot do that as well. If they found a way, for instance, to take care of the radioactive waste and security issues, it's still not going to be good enough because the modern power system that the region's governments are trying to chase is not in fossil, it's not in rigid uh, power generation. It's in flexible generation, in particular wind and solar, and uh, uh, storage as well, whether it's pump storage or hydrogen or, or, or another form of batteries. And in this case, the region has to have different uh, solutions and different approaches. The power systems are wildly different. There is a completely liberalized market in the Philippines, and you have something that is completely opposite in Indonesia and Vietnam. Jürgen was talking about vested interests in the country. I'm not sure that alone is the big problem. The problem is also what Sven said earlier. Price is not going to be enough. It will never be enough to sway um, governments from taking different directions. Because in the case of solar, for instance, in the Philippines, you have massive amounts of companies that are ready to install. However, if the banks in the country continue to behave like pawn shops without understanding that the risks uh, can actually create different risk appetites whereby they will make more money if they rely on flexible generation in terms of renewable energy and provide uh, financing for merchant solar, for instance, then uh, we're out of the woods. The problem right now is they prefer still because of that concept mentality, uh, they keep looking for power purchase agreements that are going to be for 15 or 20 years, when in fact, um, shorter and shorter contracts, especially because we have a wholesale electricity spot market, will actually give them something that's far bigger. And so um, the, the point here is that everything needs to change and influence um, different institutions to, to ensure that our energy transition actually accelerates, then it cannot be on generation alone. We need to look at grid in terms of modernization. We need to look at what is it that the banking sector requires in order 
have to address this um, this pawn shop mentality. Guarantee that their risk appetites can also change, and we need to see linkages between Indonesia, Vietnam, and the Philippines and Thailand, including in particular our East Asian economies, because this is a region where the fortunes of countries like China or Japan or Korea are all tied to. I mean, if Japan, for instance, simply convert a fleet that is designed to move LNG towards hydrogen, then they will be spelling out their future for the longer term, rather than right now, which is actually limited, because the more they focus on LNG and uh, 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 ensuring that their fleets respond to something that will have a very short shelf life, then uh, their economies would be growing as well. So we okay. need something far bigger than just one intervention. We need a sweep and we need it soon. And that seems such a good place to wrap up the panel and take this conversation forward both into the networking and into the next session of this three-part pilot that REN21 is running. So thank you for um, a very lively uh, conversation, albeit quite short, um, but we hope you'll stay around um, for the networking as well, Sven, uh, Rebecca and Red. Um, I, apologies to all those who haven't yet had their questions answered. I guess that is just uh, a reason to come back for more next time uh, and to see if you can uh, uh, um, explore those questions further, um, but also to hang on for the networking. So at this point, what I'd like to do is say thank you very much to the three of you and um, ask you maybe to turn your cameras and your microphones off and then invite uh, Rana uh, back up to the stage. Bye, Sven. <laughs> um, to uh, yeah, to uh, to wrap up today's um, event. Welcome back, Rana. Yeah, thank you. So I guess like uh, I, I will not even try to wrap up. I I, I don't think that I would uh, I would. Um, how do you say this in English? Anyway, I, I, I would be able to reflect all the thought out there. Um, I think what I'll what I'll take with me, and I I feel we have seen it in the chat, we have seen it in the in, in the engagement. There is not enough time to discuss. Uh, we've heard it from the panelists. Um, we need to work together. Um, different voices are needed. Um, I found it also very interesting to see like the discussions about CCS that we have basically. We do not agree on all aspects on the way to reach probably similar goals. And I think uh, this clearly showed that um, it's a good decision to kick this off as something more continuous and continue the discussions. Um, I also clearly hear basically this, uh, I think this feedback on the ownership and I think this is super, super important and um, from renting one side, I think it's uh, it, it's very clear. We, we see from, let's say, uh, the more, uh, probably much more European experiences here that uh, bringing players together and bringing the different perspectives together is creating some tensions. Um, but uh, ultimately also really allows to identify common grounds and uh, opportunities to create pressure points. And I think this is something I found really interesting also from, uh, from all speakers actually. Um, pressure points are super important. And what is also important I think is um, clearly this part of shifting from a fuel switch mentality, which was probably in the beginning uh, of uh, the renewable energy development to something which is um, much more systemic. So, uh, and it's beyond the energy system only. I think uh, Daniel had mentioned this a lot. Um, Red has mentioned it. So uh, most of the speakers, we need to create the societal support. And that's a reality. And this needs to be reflected in the discussions. It needs to be reflected in the policies and regulatory frameworks in the market. So I guess like I'm very, very much looking forward to continue the discussion. Um, I really invite uh, all of you to to use this uh, use this space as an opportunity to shape the space. Um, this is really what we are looking for. Um, in order to make those links so that we can collectively increase our impact. 
and um, I think we are we have uh, so I, I am very I, I would like to ask uh, to to thank because I'm very sorry I forget to mention this uh, in in the intro uh, to thank ETP and case basically um, because I think regionally they are connecting players you have seen we had a couple of institutional players in the region um, I think it's also for setting uh, setting basically the fr framework um, I'm very much looking forward to bring um, other diverse national local etc voices to future discussions and I would like to thank obviously all panelists but the audience uh, to be here and engage and I hope that I'll see many of you around in the networking and I think we have uh, Guamaka uh, no or Crit I don't know yes I think, so. yeah, yeah, I think it's Crit <laughs> and uh, Yes, and maybe just because I um, I had a super cool slide uh, prepared by the team, which I also forgot to show. So uh, the team is Crit, um, Guamaka, and uh, Vibu, who you can reach out to. You can reach them by community at rentunron.net. And please be in touch, and I look forward to more discussions. Crit, over to you. Thank you, Rebecca. All right. Yes. Uh, thank you all. All right. Um, I'm Kriet Wongsa. I'm a RIM21 Regional Coordinator for Southeast Asia. I would like to extend my appreciation, a warm welcome, and a fair farewell to all speakers, the facilitating team, the organizing team, but most of all, to all the audience that we have today. That is fantastic. So this event is the first of our three event series in Southeast Asia. We will have the next one on Thursday, the 19th of August. So mark your calendar. It will be in um, technology theme. The title would be Reimagining Renewables Futures for Southeast Asia. And then the last one on Wednesday, the 22nd of September on Capital Theme, the title would be Accelerating Renewables Investment in Southeast Asia, Challenges and Opportunities. <laughs>